And it's great to see you all here this evening uh, for what a lecture with a tremendously presumptuous title before you. No one in their right mind can possibly do justice to this enormous scan of subjects we're going to be talking about here. But I hope to open several horizons for you that are interesting and extremely topical in modern science. So our roadmap for this whole discussion is to understand how stars precondition the conditions necessary to form planets and life in the cosmos, and how do they do this, and is it a very general process that we're looking at? So in my roadmap for the talk tonight, we're going to talk about stars uh, and how they cycle, how they are formed in dense gas interstellar medium, how they produce planets, how they recycle energy and elements back into the element, into the interstellar medium, keep this process going, all the while showering materials uh, rich in biomolecules onto these newly formed planets, such as meteorites and comets containing amino acids, creating the conditions for life. And this is, our, this is going to be our journey tonight, and I hope, uh, I hope you a good voyage. So first of all, astrobiology is the search for life in the cosmos. It's an emergent science, it's a very exciting one. It's one well represented that we found it in the Origins Institute, and it's based on three scientific revolution, which billions of dollars are being spent in each of these, in some of these areas. The first is the breakthrough by microbiologists only about a decade ago with the understanding that microbes on the Earth, which are the bulk of our biomass on this planet, can adapt themselves to extreme environments, here too thought to be unacceptable, inability to support life. Here we have organisms that happily live in rock uh, 3,000 meters beneath, uh, 2,800 meters beneath the surface of the Earth. Uh, here up, the second major revolution is the space revolution, follow on from the exploration of the solar system here with robotic exploration of planets like Mars, with tasked with the searching for evidence for water, tasked in the coming missions to look for evidence for life. And thirdly, the enormous investment in astronomy to the tune of, bil of several billion dollars now in the new instruments and telescopes we're bringing online, one of the main scientific drivers of which are the search for exoplanets, in particular planets like our Earth that can support life. So this is an enormous and interesting journey that a huge scientific population is taking part in. Um, but to think a little bit about what we need to understand here, let's just step back for a moment and look around us and ask the question, what do we think is needed to support life? We don't know about life in weird life and all of its exotic nature will no doubt stumble upon one day, but we can ask the question, how do we get other places or what is involved in setting up the addition for life on a planet like ours? Uh, a rocky planet. We don't know how to make life uh, in atmospheres of giant planets like Jupiter. Our planet needs water to support life. Uh, the driest places on our planet, the Atacama Desert, are the places where there's the lowest count of cells that we can find. Uh, carbon, all of the long chain molecules that code for proteins, that code for a replication of cells, are couched in the language of carbon, uh, carbon rich molecules. Uh, we need that to make complicates molecules in the universe, and energy sources. These can be, doesn't have to be the sun as the driving energy source, they can be chemicals as well. So with this, if we try to search for conditions that create these four types of ideas, okay, uh, what is possible? What do stars do to arrange these kind of conditions in the cosmos? One of the most important things to understand about stars, the first part of my talk, is that their mass controls a great deal of what they can do to the universe. Okay? So it's very important to plot out how many stars there are per unit mass as we look around us in the galaxy and other galaxies. So it's a simple counting problem. We look at a mass of a star, we say how many of them are there, and we draw curves like this, uh, here going from a tenth of a solar mass out to tens. There's much more massive stars further out here, uh, but uh, or, um, this is a logarithmic scale, so here we're at 100 solar masses, et cetera, okay? So in this plot shown here, uh, we want to ask ourselves, what kind of curves fit this uh, plot here? The only bit of uh, a little analysis I'm going to throw at you this evening is that this curve shown right here, this dashed line, is what's known as a log normal curve. 
I'm going to come back to this. It's related to the bell curve by which we were all graded you know, a long time ago, and maybe we still are. But hold that in your mind. Uh, does this describe the distribution of masses of stars or not? The peak mass that we see in the distribution of stars is about 20% of the mass of the sun, about 0.2 times the mass of the sun. What is important about stellar masses? Two things. Uh, here we see a plot of mass and how luminous a star is. So if we go to one solar mass here and we go to 10, we see that the brightness of a star increases by a factor of 1,000. Put it this way, take a star that's two times the mass of the sun and put it right beside the sun. It will appear to be eight times brighter. Okay? That's a lot. Uh, the most massive stars in our galaxy are up to 100 times the mass of the sun. Think how voluminous that is. And you realize that uh, the luminosity of stars here, different kinds of stars, the lowest mass star in the galaxy, M stars, shown here out to O stars, have temperatures of tens of thousands of degrees. Uh, our sun here as measured in, in luminosity units of the sun here, 100,000 times the luminosity of the sun and beyond. Okay? Those are the types of stars that we find in the cosmos. What's important about them for supporting and driving planet formation? Uh, it's following. Low mass stars like our sun live about 10 billion years, primarily burning, burning hydrogen. In that time, we think that Earth has supported life for at least three and a half billion years. So this is sufficiently long time to have development of complex life like our own. Okay? High mass stars burn fur furiously through their fuel and live only a million years or so, a few million. And from what we know by arguing from conditions on the Earth, a planet around such a star would never get a chance to start life, let alone anything complicated. These stars then explode, produce the biogenic elements, elements interesting for building planets, etc., and uh, tossing these elements into the interstellar medium. Here's a second aspect about what a star is that controls the planetary environment around it. These are habitable zones. Plotted here in stellar radii, uh, as we move out here is distance from the central star, measured in astronomical units. One astronomical unit is the distance between us and our sun. Okay? I'm going to do a lot of measurements in that distance scale. Uh, here are the different masses of stars we looked at. And what's plotted in this green curve here is the zone around the planet, that set of orbital radii, in which if we place a planet here, water will remain liquid. Okay? And you see that here, uh, starting at a tenth of a solar mass star, uh, that's about a tenth of, the, of an astronomical unit here for an M star, very close. If we get out to a G star like our own, that's an orbit, one astronomical unit. It's a period of a year. And more massive stars as we go up here, that habitable zone is further and further out to several astronomical units. So planets placed here or here of this zone will, not, will be frozen or too hot and dry to support the life that we are uh, thinking about. Okay? The mass of a star is determined by, uh, it comes from its conditions of formation. So, our task now immediately to understand how do stars form to account for that mass distribution. So several giants of intellectual history are involved in understanding this whole process. The famous German philosopher Emmanuel Kant and uh, the brilliant French mathematician uh, uh, Simon Laplace were the first to conceive of how this process may actually work by thinking about observations that William Herschel was making in the mid-18th century here on nebulae, fuzzy nebulae, uh, that one he saw through his newly developed telescopes. And he speculated that nebulae, that I'll show you in a moment, uh, those shining bits of gas were regions that stars could form within. Okay? Laplace, the Newton kind of, of, of uh, French science, if you will, took this idea and developed a theory for it, which said that sun and planets form by collapsing out of such a rotating cloud that collapse to a disk. And in, the, in so doing, you produce a planetary system that fragments out of that disk. The reason a disk is important here is because if you look at where planets are in the night sky, you will see that they're always confined for a few degrees of a certain plane, okay, uh, called the ecliptic. Uh, so disks are the way planets are arranged and how they form. And the first idea for that was Laplace's. 
how this might work. Uh, so let's take a look at the gas out of which stars form then. Uh, this is a shocking story, to say the least. This is a piece of the gas at the midplane of our galaxy measured by the so-called Canadian Galactic Plane Survey. You're looking with radio telescopes at atomic hydrogen glowing at you, and you see highly filamentary gas here with holes blown in it. Those holes are due to massive stars that blow up in supernova explosion, create winds, etc. So this is a tortured, turbulent, shocked place in which stars are born. Looking down at our galaxy, if we look down upon the top of it, as M51 would look here, you see these spiral lanes here with dust gathered in here, dust and gas clouds gathered in these spiral lanes, highly filamentary structure, the places where star clusters are born, and it bears all the sign of a heavily shocked interstellar medium. Again, familiar to atmospheres, here many of you probably know where the Orion constellation is in the sky. Many degrees, very prominent in the winter sky in Canada. Here are the belt stars, uh, the shoulder stars, and down to the sword of Orion here you see a fuzzy patch. An optical astronomer's galaxy is pretty boring. If you look at the galaxy in infrared wavelengths, uh, you would see this in this part of the sky. This is the highly filamentary gas and dust clouds here glowing. The dust grains in this gas are glowing in infrared wavelengths because they're heated by the new stars that are forming. And this is what the night sky looks like. This is the region of the Orion Nebula. And within that region is one of the most beautiful uh, astronomy pictures here, the Orion star cluster that's being born in this region of gas here. This is about 400 parsecs away from us in the galaxy. Uh, three, three light years is about one parsec, if you know that unit better. This is an infrared picture of the Orion Nebula. This region is about a parsec across. And within it, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of stars that are forming right here. Our sun was born in a star cluster like this. This is where the typical birthplace of stars in the galaxy are in clusters. Uh, Latest observations from a brand new telescope, the Spitzer uh, Telescope, launched uh, a couple of years ago, uh, taking wonderful data in the infrared on where stars are located and how they're associated with the gas out of which they form. So here is this highly filamentary Orion Nebula cloud I showed you a moment ago, 10 parsecs and more in length. And this is the scattering of young stars. This is a complete inventory of where stars are forming in this cloud shown here. Okay. This cloud is uh, about 100,000 times the mass of the sun, total mass, one of the most massive things in the galaxy. Uh, it is cooled down to about 10 degrees, the conditions just perfect to have stars condense out of them. What is the link between the gas and the stars? What is the link between the masses of dense regions that could form and collapse into stars following uh, this idea that we have? Uh, from Laplace and the actual distribution of stars I talked a moment ago. So here's a cloud called the Pipe Nebula. And here you see one of our filaments. And shown in the circles are dense gaseous cores. This is a region of very high gas density. In this business, that means uh, 10,000 particles per cubic centimeter. Okay? That is a very high density. That is uh, way lower than density than we can ever make in the best vacuum in, in, on the Earth. But this suffices to be a region where gas, where stars get their start. Uh, shown here is the distribution of masses of these cores in this curve, and shown over compared to our mass function for stars. And you see they're similar. In fact, one can be laid over the other. And this overlay is a factor of three between the two. So if we took these cores and we stripped 2 thirds of the mass out of them, we would have a star. So the process that's generating this structure in the gas in the galaxy seems to be responsible for setting up the masses of stars. So what is that process? Now I want to talk to you about distributions. Um, let's play a game of dice. I take two dice, and uh, the numbers one and six, and I do the game of I throw these dice randomly, and I add the numbers on the two dice. So I get a number between 2 and 12 if I just do the addition. The average number then that I get if I plotted them up, I get a plot of values in my dice that looked like this curve, the average being 7. 
let's do this game again where I throw the dice and I multiply the two numbers that I have. I now get a number between 1 and 36. But as you can, if you do this game, you'll realize that most, it's very rare to get numbers up like 36. More often you get um, numbers way beneath that. You have a very skewed distribution when you multiply things. So this is the bell curve. You're all familiar. This is actually data from biology. This is the distribution of women's heights. And over here is the distribution of some chemicals all HMF. I'm not a chemist. Don't know what that is. But in honey samples, OK? Log normals are absolutely ubiquitous in nature. And they happen when you have a multiplicative process. So what's the multiplier, the multiplicative process for stars which follow this distribution? Uh, Nicholas Kevlinhan and I at the Institute have recently published a paper which makes this mathematically very clear. If take a piece of gas that you hit with a shock, okay, its density goes up. If you hit it with another shock, its density is multiplied by the, by the strength of the shock you just hit it with. So the density that you build up is the product of all the shock strengths that you, this piece of gas gets hit with in our turbulent medium. Okay? That very rapidly builds up a beautiful log normal distribution. So in essence, the mass distribution of stars that's controlling everything is a reflection of this process of turbulence, of a highly shocked galaxy. Ours is not the only one like this. Any interstellar medium that we've checked in in other galaxies is like this. Let's take the next step down. Worry about planets. Where do they come from? We've got the clouds in which the stars form. If we now ask ourselves, these clouds are actually observed to rotate. And here in this brilliant HST picture of young stars and formation in the Orion Nebula region, you see these flattened rotating structures where actually the disks in which presumably planets are forming as I speak. Okay? So uh, this is uh, about 100 astronomical units in, ex in extent here. And over the right is a picture of a dust, dusty disk uh, with a hole in it, hole the size of the, that would fit our planetary system in here. So this is the Epsilon Erdani system. And it's believed to be cleared out by planet formation in here with dust and probably comets in the outer part. So we see disks around all young stars. We also see jets. This is one of my pet topics. I have to show this slide. I think it's one of the most wonderful pictures from the Space Telescope Institute. Here we see a disk edge on around a young star. And this high speed jet coming out here is moving at three or 400 kilometers per second. This is the one aspect of star formation that wasn't thought about by Kant, Laplace, and other famous thinkers in time is a complete surprise in star formation and is the, is the way that disks get rid of their excess angular momentum, as it turns out. And I'll show you this in a moment. So what's a theoretical picture we can create here? The idea, we, the shocks that I've shown you compress the interstellar medium into these dense filaments. Pieces of those, if they get dense enough, can turn around and collapse. Uh, and uh, we have, don't have a complete theory of this by any means, but we have some wonderful computer simulations uh, developed over the last decade that have made the true advances in this field possible. Uh, before I show you how we form a disk, um, I want to say that uh, the basic theory following on from Laplace was developed by Sir James Jeans which says that in order to have a region from this diffuse gas, remember we're starting gas that's about 10,000 particles per centimeter cubed, and we have to boot that up to the density of the sun, which is about 10 to the 24. And we have to go many orders of, mag orders of magnitude uh, to receive, get to this average density of water, which is, the comp is how the uh, sun is, consists of. Uh, this trick, it means that if we make a mass of a cloud massive enough so that it exceeds the mass that could be supported by its own internal pressure. If we get to a limit like that, then this region can collapse under its own weight. And that's what leads to the formation of a star. Okay? If we add some rotation to this and even thread this region with a magnetic field, then what you get is the formation of a disk and, as I'll show you, an outflow. My computer wakes up. So here you'll see a collapsing region, and there's magnetic field lines in here. And in a moment, you'll see a very brilliant and very active outflow that's working as soon as we get collapse occurring. 
Uh, we can follow this further. And here is a wonderful move. This is a PhD project of one of my students to show you how a disk develops and the outflow with it. So we're zooming in. These are magnetic field lines, highly wound up. This, this calculation beats up God knows how many computer hours. This is only possible because we have great computers here at McMaster and under SharkNet. You see a disk developing down in here. We're looking at scales of thousands of astronomical units. We're getting high-speed jets being emitted here, just as the HST jets are starting off. And we've got the properties of the disk in here, which is setting up the conditions uh, for planet formation. Yes, so now I want to show you a simulation also done here at McMaster in collaboration with researchers at Heidelberg University to show you how a whole cluster of stars will develop. And this is a region of turbulent gas that's shown right in here. And I will, this has uh, many hundreds of genes masses initially in it. And a region of about a half a parsec, parsec in size. Up here is a box that tells you the mass of individual stars that you'll be seeing as white dots that appear in this screen. Okay. And I hope that you'll be able to see this from where you're sitting. Unfortunately, my box went away, but you see that the filaments are appearing here due to the shock waves. And as these filaments develop, we're now at uh, half of free fall time, time taking for gas to fall freely to the center of this region. Uh, we don't have any, there's our first object that appears. And as this region surrounding collapses, here's another star that appears. There's another one. You notice they follow a filament like that picture I showed you before. And, and as time goes on, we have 25 objects now. We've used up about 15% of the gas to form them. Here's a few art liars starting to form. This whole cluster is starting to collapse now in this calculation. And you can see the stars starting to interact with one another here dynamically. The end of the calculation will end up here at a time of about, uh, 100, about a few hundred thousand years into the life of this cluster, which we formed a group here of about 60 stars. Now, um, I'm going to get on to the next question here of how we our next test, we've uh, demonstrated how we get stars. How do stars control planet building? How do they control the process of building molecules in their environments, et cetera? But the first question, therefore, here is, how do we build the energy, the elements necessary for life? And by that, I mean carbon, in the first instance. And later, I'll also touch on iron, which uh, we find in the interiors of a planet such as our own. Okay? So our sun at the moment is busily doing the following pro the reaction here in nuclear physics, collisions of protons, which can occur only in the very high density and million degree temperatures we have at the center of the sun. And in that reactor, uh, we can, when protons collide, uh, we can produce then for each set of four protons that we feed into this reaction, we can produce a helium nucleus, that's uh, two protons and two neutrons here. Uh, we get energy coming out of this reaction, and we also have the release of a couple of neutrinos in this reaction. The neutrinos escape freely out of the star and can be measured in Canada's Snow uh, Observatory, uh, Sudbury Nuclear, uh, Neutrino Observatory, uh, set up, up in uh, Sudbury. The energy that's released is predicted by Einstein's famous formula. That is, the difference in mass between the helium-4 and four protons uh, is that mass difference multiplied by c squared is the energy that's being released here. And that's how the sun can be powered for up to 10 million years, uh, 10 billion years. During its burning, uh, we'll reach a stage, not quite yet, but soon, 
in which uh, the center of, the, of our sun gets burned out of hydrogen. It starts burning here in a shell. It's shown in its interior here. And the ash, if you like, is the helium that piles up in the center of the star. And we have this shell burning structure eating out through fresh hydrogen at larger layers to the star. Fine and good. Here's the step where we try to make carbon. Now something extraordinary happens. So the way to build carbon, as was realized decades ago by Fred Hoyle and a few others, is that you collide two helium nuclei together. Helium-4, the common isotope of helium, bash them together to get this next element, beryllium. And then if you hit this beryllium again with another helium, you'll produce the common isotope of carbon. And we're there. Okay? These are both energy producing. The trouble with this, the naive calculation of this process, ran immediately into a huge problem. The problem is that beryllium is highly unstable. It likes to fall apart again into its constituent so-called alpha particles here within a millionth of a billionth of a second. It's not very long. Okay? It's pretty unstable. So how do we produce carbon in the universe? This was a huge challenge that was meant by this brilliant young guy here, Fred Hoyle. Fred Hoyle is familiar to some of you as the author of a well-known science fiction novel from the last generation, The Black Cloud. To others, you may know him as the author of Steady State Theory of Cosmology before the Big Bang idea was around. But his greatest contribution to science, in my view, is understanding nuclear physics, the understanding of the origin of elements and how stars work. So Hoyle brilliantly deduced that since carbon must be formed, he calculated and predicted a kind of, sort of resonant phenomenon. That's, uh, a resonance is when things oscillate together okay, in a coherent sort of a way. Then you can exchange energy and keep things together for a little bit longer than if you just had completely chaotic oscillations. That's what a physicist means when they say a resonance. He predicted the appearance of a resonance in this interaction that allowed this region to remain alive a little bit longer, allowing the reaction to go forward. If you take this calculation seriously, you find out that if you just change the strength of the nuclear force by 1 or 2 percent, that's all you'd need to do, this reaction wouldn't occur, and we know of no way that we'd make carbon in stars and therefore in the universe. In such a case, the universe would be, if this failed, if we had a slight readjustment, the universe would consist only of hydrogen and helium because that's what comes to us from the Big Bang, and nothing else. I defy you to make a living thing out of helium. That much I think we can guarantee ourselves. So this would be a universe without life. So what happened? Martin Rees calls this a biofriendly universe. How did this get arranged? Does the laws of physics that get stamped in the early phase of the universe somehow magically prescribe this fine tuning? Or is it something else? Uh, Martin Rees' view of this is that uh, perhaps we are just one of countless infinity of universes. We live, ours is a, a one of a multiverse, in which in our universe, this tuning is just right. And of course, then we can have lectures like this in the evening. We can sit around and think about these things. Uh, many universes wouldn't have this capability. So here's an extraordinary point that we reach to in this whole thinking about stars and life on this very interesting question of producing carbon. Okay. Well, from there, uh, our sun will one day toss off its outer layers. Uh, we will have what's left. Most of the carbon of our sun will be locked up in this white dwarf, which is the size of the Earth. And it will cool down and play a little role in further enriching the universe. If we take a more massive star, however, something, say, more than eight times the mass of the sun, we can burn here carbon into uh, other fuels. Carbon will burn in its day into higher elements. Oxygen will burn. Neon will burn. Magnesium will burn, and so on. An entire burning sequence as we go to higher and higher uh, atomic numbers of elements with iron produced in the middle. So in this sequence, it'll take Ten mil, a, few mil, a million years or so to build the hydrogen, carbon burns for a thousand years, silicon in a week, and when iron appears, it, it gathers only in a day 
and then this whole structure becomes terribly unstable because iron doesn't fuse. When iron appears, you've got temperatures like 10 billion degrees in the center of a star, the new iron nucleus falls apart, the star becomes terribly unsta unstable, and it blows up. That's a supernova. From our point of view, the supernova is extremely important because it tosses elements back into the interstellar medium. And here's a supernova pictured, in, uh, seen in a neighboring gal another galaxy, NGC 1646. And what's shown over here in this image is the presence of dust, very, very strong amount of dust emission in this remnant that the supernova explosion is driving the interstellar medium. So we're actually watching metals, what an astronomer calls a metal, anything heavier than helium, by the way. So carbon is a metal for us, okay? Uh, here you see actual metals being tossed into the stellar medium of this galaxy, and this will be incorporated into the star-forming gas around here for the next generation of stars to form. So we're watching this in action. What happens if we go back in time to ask ourselves what the first stars were doing. How did the first star form in the cosmos, and what did it do to its environments? We've seen here we were enriching our environment with metals, carbon, uh, iron, et cetera, that we can, the stuff of building planets and molecules. What happened then? Uh, to do that, we're going to take this time voyage uh, using the Hubble Space Telescope. We travel in time in astronomy because fainter things are farther away, typically. Farther away things take light longer to reach us and therefore those things are further back in time, okay? So here we board our time machine, and we look back into the universe to a time here uh, where galaxies are only a billion years old at the far farthest patches that you see here. You see recognizable galaxies to those around us. Here are spiral galaxies and ellipticals, but there's lots of faint, fuzzy fluff all over the here that has no very low mass, that have no direct link to galaxies as we know them, so we're seeing the universe at the time where galaxies are starting to get started. So this voyage that I've taken you on goes like this. Here we are at 13.7 billion years after the Big Bang, and we voyage back in time by making observations of fainter and fainter objects. We see nearby galaxies, we see those in formation, and as we go back, we reach the, the gas in these galaxies gets denser and denser, space uh, in, in the, size of objects is smaller, till we get to a point here, about 400 million years ago, where the gas becomes opaque, where, uh, more exactly, all the gas between galaxies and our entire voyage has been ionized. That is, uh, hydrogen has been stripped of its electron. Here we have neutral hydrogen. Gas is neutral, okay? Something that energized all the gas in our voyage back in time here no longer exists here. What doesn't exist here are the young stars that first started to heat and ionize the gas universe, we think, at about 400 million years ago. Okay? So the first stars played an enormous role in changing the evolution of the, galaxy, of, the, of the cosmos, or at least the gas in it. We can simulate this. We had a brilliant talk from Tom Abel a couple of years ago on how this works. For simulations, this is a much easier task than we face in star finish, save for one difficulty. We have gas that consists only of hydrogen and helium. Dust, carbon, iron are not around yet. There's no magnetic fields, we think. Uh, so we have less difficulties here. The greater difficulty is that the object in which the first star forms is not a galaxy. It's a bit of dark matter, about a million times the mass of the sun. Most of our galaxies are made of dark matter. We can't see it. We know it exists. Back then, we're looking at a little clump of dark matter, about a million solar masses, into which gas cools, condenses, and the first star forms. So that is shown in here. These pictures shown a sequence back in time from here, back to uh, further in time to about 400 million years over here. But over here, we see how dark matter gathers together in these highly filamentary shapes with our dark matter into which gas, which is shown here, infalls, cools, and here we're at a scale of about 0.06 parsecs. Remember, that's the same scale for star formation I showed you for our current day. There's about 100 solar masses of material in here. Okay? That's thought to be collapsing to a star. When that star turns on, 
as now it produces a 100 solar mass star, produces an enormous amount of energy that heats and ionizes the gas in, around it out to 1,000 parsecs away from the star, gets heated up. And this is how we heat and ionize the gas between galaxies by these young stars that form. When these stars blow up, they do it in an interesting way, different than what happens now. Uh, so here is the simulation of the first supernova explosion from a 100 solar mass star or so shown here and exploding here in a different time frames out to 200 million years, which is shown in this picture. This nebula has expanded out to about a thousand parsecs. And this supernova explosion is interesting. Uh, if you are in this range of masses, 140 to 260 times the mass of the sun, there's nothing left after these supernovae go off. They entirely obliterate a star. There's no remnant left. This is so-called pair instability supernova. Um, but uh, all the metals get thrown into the interstellar medium. Uh, from that point, the first star then that's formed, as shown in here, has thrown elements into the interstellar medium and enriched the stars that start to form afterwards. The oldest star that we've been able to discover in the galaxy uh, by Frabel in this paper here is 13 billion years old. That's incredibly close to the Big Bang itself. So that registers as a star that must have appeared soon after the very first stars in the universe appeared. And it's a member of our own galaxy. Its metal content is about a thousandth of the metal of the sun. Now we've prepared the ground, I want to talk for a few minutes about uh, exoplanets. Uh, we've had several speakers in the Institute talk to you about exoplanets, but uh, as I mentioned in my introductory remarks, uh, we have this surprising and very interesting set of 400 objects now, only a fraction of which are shown here. This is a famous plot in which we put the distance that a planet is from its star. Here's four astronomical units for these and for the type of star shown here. And this is the position that a planet is, and we register the masses of these objects. Okay. The interesting thing about this plot is that uh, we find Jupiters at the relative position of Mercury. There is no theory that we know of that can, predict, that can produce a, Ju a Jovian planet, a gas giant planet, condensing out of a disk at that small distance from its central star. It's simply too hot. So the idea is that these planets must have been formed at farther distances, or our own Jupiter is out here at five, and drifted into the positions that we see. That's the theoretical idea that we've developed to explain this. The masses of planets, their, their distribution of masses is shown here. Okay? So this is one Jupiter mass, and this is 15 shown in here. And uh, this plot, it, it, we, the lowest mass stars that we have are way off the picture over here at about uh, 30 or 40 or 50 uh, times the mass of Jupiter. So planetary masses are cleanly separated from the masses of the lowest stars. They must form in a different kind of a way, but in the, kind of di in the same disk that the star itself is forming. I mentioned to you uh, before that we want to get information about the radius of a planet. And we can do that by staring at a star long, waiting for the passage of a star of a planet to cross its face. We then diminish the light from this star by the area of this little disk here. And by, by uh, watching this over repeated periods, we're able to deduce, in the face of very strong uh, signal to noise, as we say, you can pick out this periodic signal and deduce the size of the dip and hence the size of this planet. Kepler is doing this for about 100,000 stars as I speak. Uh, and by doing so, we're looking actually for objects the size of an Earth passing with an orbital period of a year around a star like our own. In other words, a planet like ours in the habitable zone. We will have information about this in two or three years' time, which time I hope we will have a speaker here telling you about the discovery of water-bearing Earths. We hope. <clears throat> what is important about knowing the mass and radius of a planet? Here we plot the mass over here, and here's the radius. 
Here's a dot for the, plant, the dots for the planets we found. And this curve here shows you what you expect from the mass and radius for models in which you've comprised your planet primarily of hydrogen and helium, like Jupiter. Okay? So these planets we've discovered, our models tell us, yes, indeed, these are gas giant planets like Jupiter. Rocky planets, like our own planetary system here, the Earth, Mars, Venus, etc., are shown not for these. And the composition that we need to understand those involve iron, magnesium, etc. Okay. The bottom line is the composition of materials out of these disks, out of which planets form, determine their comp that composition determines the type of planet it will be. So this enrichment process, the stuff we find in disks, is determining the very structure of the planets that are going to be built. Here is the second, here's one of the most interesting results of planetary results that we have so far. Here we ask the question, uh, take a look at the metallicity, how enriched the star is in, in a particular planetary system. The amount of metal it contains reflects the amount of metal that a plant, the gas out of which a planet is born. So this shows you in systems which are a, a tenth of the metallicity of the sun, uh, we find no planets. Now, I just showed you examples of stars, older stars in the galaxy, that are metallicities of a hundredth or a thousandth out of the sun, far back in time. Presumably, this plot tells us that those systems don't have planets around them. Life has not yet been able to appear because there's just not enough metal around to build a planet. Okay. So building the, the planet building era is in, only in places in, it could be different in the centers of galaxies, but only in regions where we seem to have enough metal around. How do we build planets? Uh, I want to show you how, uh, just briefly, uh, how we would build up the rocky core of a planet. So here is looking at a patch of a disk. Okay? Uh, looking down on it, and gas is orbiting this way. The gas in here is turbulent. And here's a little turbulent region shown right here. Now, just like a traffic pileup on the 401, if you've ever seen one of those awful things, it's a very foggy day, you know, someone puts on the brakes, and car after car, zooming down the highway, doesn't know about the existence of that stopped car, and piles into them. You go from a small object like a Volkswagen to, you know, 100 cars piled up on the highway. You very quickly build a large object. Here's how we can quickly build a planetesimal from basically a centimeter dust grain that gets stuck in a real tur turbulent region here. Uh, turbulent regions capture this dust, and dust from larger orbits piling into it. You see this dust region, this is we're going in different times, two rotation periods, three, four, five. Here we go from centimeter size objects. Within about five rotation periods of the disk, we've generated planetesimals that are 100 kilometers in size. This is a brand new result, computation done a few years ago, which has opened the way to understand how planets are built out of dust, and very rapidly. Jupiters form, uh, there's an added complication to form a Jupiter. We have to have a rocky core goes one model. So here's time in 10, bil 10 million years. Uh, and uh, if we have planet, planetesimal appearing here, up, up to 10 times the Earth mass, yet finally at a few tens of thousands of years, there's enough gravity to draw in the gas, which is shown here. And we can build a Jupiter in this picture in about 8 uh, million years, which is uncomfortably long because uh, disks only last for a, up to 10 million years. So this is a very touch and go process to build a Jupiter in this picture. I'm going to pass on uh, to just tell you how planets end up at short period orbits. Um, here are two planetesimals that have built up in a gaseous disk. They're moving in orbit, shown this way. Each of these, the gravitational pull of this planet on the gas around it raises these waves. I think you can see them from where you're sitting. These are tidal influences of this planet on the gas, one here to the interior, one to the exterior. 
Now, both of these waves actually tug back on the planet, okay, in their own turn. So this guy tugs back on here and likes to extract angular momentum out of this planet, and if the, its tug would end up the planet moving outwards. The outer wake here, tugging on the planet, uh, tends to remove angular momentum, allowing the planet to move inwards. The difference between the tugs of this wave and this wave is the net for tug on the planet, which sends it either inwards or outwards. Most of the time, it's inwards. The problem is, uh, in the basic theory for this developed in the 1980s, it, you can show that the planet would get lost in a million years. And you're gone. So you have to somehow slow this process. And I will just tell you uh, a mechanism that you could do this. Uh, idea of a dead zone that uh, was developed a few years ago uh, among the developers is my own group. Um, a dead zone is a region where there is no turbulence in the gas at all, or very little. It's a size here, it's shown at a disk of about 10 astronomical units in size. In such a region, you can show that gas that merrily streams inward from here Encountering a, zero tur a very low turbulent region just piles up, builds up its gas density. And in that case, when the planet that migrates in this distance comes across it, it actually reflects off of it and stops. And that's shown in this movie here, which I didn't catch it. So this is a cutaway version. This is the gas density shown in blue. Uh, here you see the pileup of gas in the disk, and this is a planet. The size of it indicates how mass it has, how much mass it has. The planet's inward migration is basically stopped, and over about a few, almost 10 million years here, you see the planet slowly building up, hovering on the edge of this dead zone where it gets most of its gas, and parks at an orbit that's at about the orbit of Mercury in this calculation. So we think we've found a way that you can actually stop the rapid migration of these planets, prevent them from being lost, and actually have discovered what we think is the place where Jupiters are primarily built. So let's get on to the issue of life now, my last 15 minutes. We now want to finish the job of equipping planets for life. We want to ask the question where the water comes from, and where are those biomolecules, like amino acids, that are necessary to build cells come from? Does astro do these astrophysical processes account for this, too? Uh, so uh, the water sources could be carried in by asteroids or by comets, which are ice, icy uh, bodies of ice grains gathered in the disks in which star and planets are forming. So first of all, water. Here's why we worry about how Jupiter's form. Jupiter isn't going to be the abode for life, but Jupiter's influence on the collection of those planetesimals, those 100 kilometer sized bodies we were building, is enormous. Uh, here, what we're going to do is the following calculation. Raymond et al., this very well done paper, uh, is a distribution of asteroids shown here. Uh, this is at two astronomical units. The red color codes for the amount of water. So at two or half solar uh, astronomical units, you have bodies that are dry. The gas temperature is too high. You're inside this so-called snow line. Water does not condense. So these are basically dry, dusty bodies here. Beyond the snow line, the temperature at which gas can condense into ice, these bodies are water rich. That's indicated in blue. Shown in here is the eccentricity of orbit. That is, how elliptical this orbit is. We start with a collection of things that are nicely in circular orbits. Jupiter perturbs this mess. So Jupiter is just off on the sidelines here. And you, know, you see the growing eccentricity of these bodies. As the eccentricity grows, the planets move in more elliptical orbits. They collide with one another, as they do. And we build up the masses of planets shown here. The size indicates the size of the planet. Uh, the, in the end, after 200 million years of, of uh, evolution, we're left with four or five terrestrial planets, as we have. This color codes for the water. We can ask ourselves, how much water did each planet get? So in this graph over here, uh, this is the number of planets we get with one Earth, Earth ocean's worth of water. Here's up to 10, here's up to uh, 100, and here's more than 100. Most of these bodies end up with far more water than our own Earth has. 
Uh, there are planets in this distribution which end up with 300 Earth oceans of water, true water worlds. So apparently, planetary dynamics and forming planets in the solar system produces bodies that are water rich. What about the biomolecules? If you take those icy dust grains in those disks, uh, the ices that are condensing onto them, uh, ammonia and hydrogen cyanide, and PA, uh, onto these so-called PAHs, these large uh, molecules, that, that the stuff of dust that the stars are producing, onto these PAH grains, you freeze carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and you expose this dust to radiation, like ultraviolet from our star. Uh, the central star's UV radiation falling on a dust grain breaks some of these bonds, these ice bonds here, and produces organic molecules. Experiments done in a laboratory in California in a, such a setup show that you actually can produce glycine, the simplest amino acid shown down in this figure over here, by exactly this kind of a process. And most recently, uh, the Stardust mission uh, here shown, an observatory, a satellite that passed through the tail of a comet, actually for the first time the pick, found uh, by collecting the ice grains on, in this tail of a comet, returning them to Earth for analysis, have actually detected glycine in this way. The planetesimals I was telling you about that build planets actually are warm in their interiors for a million years. The radioactive elements that a star produces, aluminum-26 is an example, is sufficient to melt the ice in these icy worlds for about a million years. And in that time where we have liquid interior and, and, and shown cutaway versions of these planetesimals, you can convert by aqueous processes these PAH uh, carbon uh, stuff that gets tossed out by stars can be converted into amino acids uh, in these calculations shown here. Uh, we know that this must be happening because if you look at meteorites, which are chips of these 100 kilometer size bodies that fall to Earth. These are meteorites. If you look into their interior, this is the famous Murchison meteorite that impacted Australia uh, in 1969, and the topic of intense interest by the meteoritic and astrobiological community contains an enormous roster of interesting molecules. There's 70 different types of amino acids, uh, most of which, of course, have no relation to life. Uh, there are the components of RNA and DNA, so-called pyrimidines. There are sugars and alcohols, uh, or the degraded versions of these things in this rock. So the infall of both comets and meteors to the Earth will bring an enormous infall of organic molecules. By which we come to uh, maybe the centermost point of the talk. We've prepared the ground. We have biomolecules falling onto planets. We're equipping with them water. We can know how they get to their habitable zones. Uh, all of this in this controlled process of star and planet formation. And the question is, what triggers life? So the thinking upon which, the ideas upon which most current thinking is based on were done by these two authors here, Oparin, a Soviet biochemist, and J.B.S. Haldane, a British biochemist uh, at Oxford. These two gentlemen, you know, working in the 1920s, separately came upon the idea that uh, basically we want to look at the formation of let life only develop once on the Earth. Okay? It doesn't continue, it's like older ideas had it, that there would be continuous, spontaneous generation of life. Uh, they just concluded that this was wrong. Life developed once, and it developed in this prebiotic hot dilute soup in an early Earth ocean or water pond and that we can understand how the components, ultimately one day we hope to, of how these components, the amino acids, got together and following laws of chemistry and physics plus a little of Darwinian evolution led to the first reproducing things. This is on which uh, these books, these ideas are which all current thinking are based on this idea. If we look at a timeline here, about how we think things developed on the Earth, at least. We've talked about the formation of planets like the Earth. There's a point where they're bombarded, which are fossilized bacteria uh, at this point. 
Uh, there's evidence that the first genetic code involving DNA and uh, amino acids kicked off here at about three and a half billion years ago. And this is the gray world we're trying to understand, the fascinating hard part. Okay? How did we go from this soup into, say, an RNA, a simpler version of our DNA protein world that must have preceded it? A molecule can both synthesize reactions and reproduce itself. That's obviously simpler than DNA, which needs protein and DNA separately you know, in combination to do this job. The uh, idea, the question about where the uh, molecules came from uh, on the surface planet that would make this prebiotic soup possible, uh, the first chemistry experiment that investigated this was the famous experiment by Stanley Miller, shown here in his laboratory in 1953. And in this experiment, he uh, basically synthesized the conditions thought to resemble early Earth atmosphere, when the Earth first got put together. Uh, so we've got a gas, at those days people thought the gases that are present, like the gases in Jupiter, consist of ammonia, methane, hydrogen. You put some water down in your reservoir, you've got your atmosphere of these gases. You strike an electrical discharge through here. Uh, the electrical discharge, what it does is it starts to make formaldehyde, as it turns out. And when you have formaldehyde, that quickly goes into production of amino acids. If you run this thing for about a day, you'll find a brown sludge appearing in your collection vessel here, and it'll be chock full of amino acids. So we didn't need to go to space to make amino acids. Maybe a planet itself can make them. If you take a bit of Merchants and Meteorite and grind it up, it contains fatty molecules which spontaneously develop into these little bags. We think that cell membranes are important for life. So if we can build up larger molecules and we spontaneously get, so here we take some molecules such as this. It's got a hydro, uh, water loving end and a water hating end. These line themselves up in this kind of a layer and you produce membranes. Yeah, this is from Merchants and Meteorite shown here. And down in here is a synthetic experiment using uh, uh, synthesized vesicles, which you're showing uh, in this fluorescence uh, micrograph encapsulating small DNA molecules. So we're starting to try to understand how you can put these simple systems together. A finally, final idea of where life may have occurred is not at all on these conditions on the surface of the Earth, but perhaps in deep oceans or inside rock. Here in the deep ocean, uh, these are hydrothermal vent openings to the hot interior of the Earth spewing through a crack in the mid-ocean trench of, the, of our planet, uh, spewing up here uh, hot, hot water elements. Uh, rich chemistry can occur here. You can, break the, you can use a sulfur-based chemistry to drive your energy production for your microorganisms. You don't need light to do it here. Okay? Uh, temperatures are very high and pressures are very high. Uh, there are organisms, remember the extremophile I talked my, started my talk with, hyperthermophiles, which are known to be adapted very well to environments like this. And perhaps that's where the first microbes formed. So what can we say about the ability to replicate, to form a genetic code? Is there anything mm -hmm. in the, what I've said so far that might lead us to suggest how a genetic code could develop, the final step, the reproducing step? This is work that the Benefit of the Origins Institute, I think a number, a number of wonderful people I've worked in the Institute uh, and, and various kinds of origins related projects. And this is one of them. Work with Paul Higgs, a biophysicist in the Institute and in our Department of Physics and Astronomy. This work would only be possible by having an initiative like we're going. I don't think I would have ever talked to Paul uh, had we not had this intellectual meeting ground that we're trying to establish in the Institute. So uh, we got excited uh, by a talk of a visiting speaker uh, through the, to the Institute uh, by the name of Everett Schock, who claimed that the evidence was that uh, amino acids, et cetera, the amount of amino acids you find in organisms, the hyperthermophiles, that basically these organisms from the bottom of the ocean were the preferred place you would make amino acids and hence the preferred place you would start life. We started to wonder about this. And uh, what the record, the relative frequencies of amino acids that we find in various arrangements might say about 
how life might have got started. So we took all the data we could find. There's actually not many much literature about there in experiments, but we gathered about 12 sources together, data from meteorites, three different meteorites, from the experiments of icy dust grains in space, from atmospheric chemistry experiments, the versions of the Miller-Urey experiment, hydrothermal vent experiments, and other chemical synthesis experiments, and just lumped all the data together. Okay? I'm into my final couple of minutes here. Uh, sorry for going a little bit late. Um, Amino acids come in two varieties. There's the variety that uh, doesn't need life to, to form. Okay? That's glycine. You can find it in the environment. Uh, that's a set of 10 amino acids that are uh, called the early type, okay? which is shown here in red. You probably can't see that. Um, alanine is an example, leucine. There's another 10 that, of the 20 that are found in living organisms that requires living organisms themselves to build them. Okay? These are the late types. So we plotted the following surprising result. This actually was the first way we plotted the data. When Paul put this, put this up on the screen, we were shocked. Uh, what this plot is is the relative frequency of an amino acid plotted against the amount of energy you need to put it together chemically. Okay? That's this so-called Gibbs free energy. Any physics or chemistry student knows what this is. Just think of it, the molecule, the energy I need to put something together, build the bonds, et cetera. This, this Gibbs free energy is characteristic of the conditions you'd find in a warm pond at a pressure of one atmosphere, temperature 18 degrees. For all these experiments together, you find this wonderful linear relationship here. These are the late amino acids. These are the early ones. These don't actually form in any of the experiments, but this is from other, we just plunked them down here in this plot. Okay, way off scale. We could plot this in an independent, another way, and that's this graph. Uh, which if we, we make all the frequencies relative to glycine, which is the simplest molecule and it's the most abundant. That's G. There's alanine and uh, the list of amino acids coming down here. And again, we see this linear relation. This line that fit, we fit through here is a line at one particular temperature, if you like. It tells us, this fit tells us that the relative abundance of these different amino acids is a probability, depends only it's a thermodynamic relation. Okay. So apparently, as long as these conditions of surface energy are obeyed, these typical conditions of pressure and temperature, a wide variety of, of, of mixes of amino acids are found. So maybe our soups contain similar amino acid frequencies to what we've just found here in the data. If thermodynamics controls it, then there's no reason it shouldn't be anywhere uh, under those sort of reasonable conditions. What does this have to do with the formation of the first genetic code? A genetic code is the link between amino acids uh, and the base pairs that, that code for them. Okay? That is, uh, we know there are four bases for DNA. Uh, three of them put together, like in these combinations shown in here, there's 64 possible combinations. And these combinations code for a particular amino acid. Uh, say these three, UUA and, and UUG here code for leucine. So do these, et cetera. Uh, this tagging allows this unit then to drop leucine in the place it should be built as you're building a protein as being coded by your DNA. So this is what we mean by genetic code, this link. Early on, uh, you would subtract out of this sequence all those amino acids that weren't there out of this original five or ten simplest ones. So the first code was highly redundant. It had lots of these triple base pairs, 64 of them, but fewer amino acids to deal with. And the ones that are the most abundant, glycine, uh, you'd be conditioning the way this code would work. The avail simply the availability, the, the frequency of amino acids around you are probably conditioning the way this code table gets set up. That's a possibility. So if this is true, so that's the hypothesis. If this is true, then thermodynamics, which controls the frequency of amino acids, uh, 
uh, the early code certainly, uh, independent of this idea, certainly dealt with a much smaller repertoire of amino acids and uh, with a larger number of these free so-called codons, these three uh, base pairs, or three bases. It turns out the people have done experiments. They've actually seen if you take uh, uh, amino acids, you can build for fewer amino acids, you can still build functional molecules, enzymes that make chemistry work in cells. Moreover, uh, it's found in the data, and this data here that we found, that the lowest cost amino acids, those containing lots of glycine, are most frequently expressed in the genetic codes. So this seems to be sensible. So, and the idea of evolution, this is the idea that Paul is, is working on with his students, is that then evolution of the code would very rapidly reach our own genetic code by doing very simple substitutions. You take a new amino acid, maybe you've found or you've made, with similar characteristics, physical characteristics to one just beside it in this table, and you put it in there, you substitute it in it, by thereby gaining a slightly more functional molecule. You allow Darwinian evolution to occur, and you'll have yourself a better organism. So uh, I'd like to conclude, first of all, by getting to buy our book. <laughs> you expected this, of course. Uh, but the basic summary of the talk, I hope, is pretty clear to you, that I've tried to show you that there's a direct route from forming stars, formation of planets, biomolecules, conditions for life on planets, and even aspects of how uh, universal aspects, the prebiotic soup in which life first formed anywhere, has certain possible universal characteristics for life as we know it. Uh, the future is very bright. We're building a 30-meter telescope, hopefully Canada's part of, the successor to the, to the, to the uh, Hubble Space Telescope, JWST. We have Mars landers going. All of this will be directed to exploring planets and for the possibility of life on them. So I, before I uh, say goodnight to you or take questions, I'd just like to thank the many collaborators, students, uh, faculty members in my home department of physics and astronomy, the Origins Institute, McMaster University for its support, NSERC, which is supplying the grant money that drives a lot of these projects, our SharkNet computing system here in the university that makes uh, some of the largest calculations that you can think of possible. Um, and then the many talented people I've had the privilege of working with here over the years and across the world. So in star formation, my former postdoc, Roby Banerjee, my current PhD student, Dennis Duffin, uh, Krista Federoth, a student in Heidelberg, Nicholas Kevlihan in the math department, Ralph Klesson from Heidelberg, Colin Norman, who comes here to give a talk on Monday, uh, through the Origins Institute on planet formation, a student Yasuhiro Hasegawa, Soka Matsumura, Ed Toms, a CETA postdoc, Dave Kirsch, another PhD student of mine, astrobiology to Paul, Greg Slater, Jeff Emerson, an undergraduate who's working on making amino acids and our planetesimals, and my Origin Institute friends and colleagues, particularly Jonathan Stone, my uh, cannot say enough for his ability to help develop our undergraduate program and many other things. And uh, most importantly, for the sanity I still possess, I think, and support my wife, Patricia, who's in the audience tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you.